a personal message. I just want to thank all the people who did uh, make a submission about the powerhouse. Uh, it's a bit difficult now, but uh, if you want to try and serve the airplanes, just send me an email to tomlockley at gmail.com and I'll send them on, uh, send it on. Um, uh, but uh, the situation's pretty dark. Anyway, uh, let's get on with the, the meeting itself. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all turning up. I'm really highly delighted. Welcome. Just before I begin, I just want to mention that uh, some slides have far too much print on them for uh, to be read in this presentation. I've left them there because I noticed that on Peter's wonderful website, lots of people are replaying uh, submissions that have been made to that site. And uh, if you want to read the detail, then I suggest that you uh, have another look at it and uh, pause when necessary to read the far too much print that is there. Anyway, let's proceed. I'm going to start this uh, story by talking about the Royal Naval Air Service. Um, Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty, was uh, keen on uh, developing an air arm and uh, the Naval Air Service was officially started in mid-1914. And you can see here one of the training aircraft, a Bristol box kite. And uh, the, the British public got uh, quite used to uh, reading tales of daring do by their brave RNS pilot, pilots, often in seaplanes. And the seaplanes at the beginning of the war were usually shorts. Short Brothers in Harland, who had a distinguished career, of course, in flying boats, um, as long as flying boats were popular. But also the uh, Naval Air Service had squadrons which flew on land, uh, both fighter and bomber squadrons. And the relevance of this is that uh, Goebel and McIntyre, the protagonists, more or less, of the fairy story, came from this background uh, to um, Australia to um, establish the Royal, Air Fo Royal Australian Air Force. Another thing that I'm going to do just to introduce this topic is to talk about seaplanes before the uh, ferries. Of course, the first seaplane to fly in Australia was Levius Foreman's Horton's Farman in Sydney in May 1914, flown by Maurice Gio. Then the war came, and uh, during the war, a couple of the Australian cruisers carried uh, spotter aeroplanes for short periods of the war. After the war, Levius Horton again entered the field, this is something I didn't know until recently, with purchase of four seaplanes. Uh, they did coastal surveys and uh, actually one of them went to New Guinea. They had quite a story. I'm going to try and develop that for another short talk some other time. But uh, the Horden seaplanes created a lot of media attention. How did we come to get the seaplanes? Well, basically, it was a captain's call by the then Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, who was still in Britain. Britain uh, dealing with the peace settlement. And uh, he ordered uh, a number of them and settled on six aircraft for $23,000. The first was accepted in August 1921 and named Mary by Mrs. Hughes herself, they sent to Australia. Um, see our ferry left short seaplanes at the beginning of the war and first of all produced this amazing looking aircraft but gradually settled down to producing a line of single engine biplane fighters, usually air usually seaplanes. And uh, the Ferry 3 at the end of the war was um, the most successful of these. 
the fairy flea three didn't really take much part in the war itself but did fight in uh, the um, war against the Bolsheviks in Russia and incidentally preferred cold climates such as uh, around Archangel to the Australian heat but uh, this point this slide makes the point that they're quite big aircraft compare the Tiger so the Fairy 3 was produced for about 12 years and uh, we have the three Fairy 3 which came to Australia and the last of the line the Fairy Seal and you can see the basic difference of uh, streamlining um, this is a table of specifications and uh, you can see that in terms of height weight etc they were very similar the main difference was the engine the um, first ferries had uh, sunbeam In Maori engines, they were replaced for the 3D by the Rolls-Royce Eagle engine, the same engine that was in the Vickers Vimy of Smith. And uh, then, as time went on, they were replaced by various engines, the most successful of which being the 570 horsepower Napier Lion, uh, which uh, boosted the maximum speed most considerably. One of the problems with the Rolls-Royce Eagle was uh, that it was hard to install neatly and the 3D you can see in pictures has uh, uh, various bits of engine sticking out the side of the engine the cell. Not very elegant. The arrival of the Fairy 3s corresponded fairly closely with the establishment of the Royal Australian Air Force. The basis of the RAF was the Imperial Gift of 1919. Australia received um, 128 aircraft in total, uh, but they were all land planes. Um, 100 were a straight gift of surplus aeroplanes after the war, and 28 were to replace aircraft which had been donated by Australians during the war. Now, as you all know, Richard Williams was the head of the Air Force, the father of the Air Force all the way through. Um, and Goebel, uh, who we'll meet, know, find out quite a lot about shortly, uh, was his number two. Williams um, was um, supported by the Army and Goebel by the Navy. Uh, seems a logical sort of argument except for one little problem. They hated each other. The objective and normally stayed Australian Dictionary of Biography says it quickly became an established practice to ensure that these two officers served as little together as possible. Um, you'll find that the uh, main development of the seaplanes occurred while Williams was overseas uh, doing a staff course. The pissing competition was clearly won by Williams. Um, in uh, World War II, uh, he still dominated the scene, whereas Goebel was uh, bombed off to uh, look after the Empire Air Training Cadets in uh, Canada. But uh, I'd like to talk a bit more about him. Like uh, Williams, he came from a middle class background. He uh, joined the Victorian Railways at age 16 and seven years later was relieving station master, fairly senior, with particular skill in Morse code, which was a great help to him when he joined the Air Force later on. He was refused uh, entry into the Australian Army because of health reasons, so he paid his own way to England and joined, joined our, the Royal Naval Air Service. Uh, he um, took part in the Dover Patrol and then went to Dunkirk as fighter pilot, scored his first victory, and became quite a successful fighter pilot, not notably over the Battle of the Somme 
and received a couple of awards for bravery. He went to 8 Squadron Royal Naval Air Service and uh, again continued his great work and this time as a bomber flying de Havilands. He won great praise for his fighting retreat, retreat during the Germans' last attack during the war when they uh, tried to win the war before the Americans came. When the RAF was established, of course, he joined that and finished the war as major with an OBE added to his other military awards. Um, Williams, by the way, was Lieutenant Colonel at this time. There wasn't a lot of money lying around when the aircraft arrived, so only one was erected, and that was ATN-1 Mary. And the first pilot of, uh, was Hippolyte Ferdinand de la Rue. His nickname was Kanga. Um, again, a, a middle-class person who had a very successful war and uh, was the only person capable of flying the uh, seaplane. So he took it for a few flights when it was assembled in uh, 1921. Uh, he stayed on and uh, was retired from the Air Force's Air Commodore in April 1946. In 1923 this fellow arrived from England, Ivor McIntyre. Had a distinguished wartime career and uh, was instrumental in bringing the uh, ferries into active service. Um, he's the pilot of the Round Australia flight, but we'll talk about briefly shortly. He's the only person to be awarded, I'll say that again, he is one of the few people to be awarded more than one Oswald Mott Watt medal. Uh, and uh, um, he actually flew Williams around the Pacific, as we'll talk about later. He left the Air Force in 1927 and six months later he was killed in a crash in a Cirrus Moth while flying for the uh, South Australian Aero Club. There's a really excellent biography of him on the South Australian Aviation website. Well, A-10 had an interesting sort of career. Uh, it conducted the first trials in aerial survey, aerial marine survey. Flew from Point Cook to Sydney on one day, uh, which was quite an achievement on, in 1923. Um, made a tour to Newcastle, did some work at uh, Jarvis Bay, and uh, had quite an interesting career for uh, only a year until on 18th of August 1924 it was crashed. The crew was killed, and the only recognisable part of any ferry that we've got is A10-1's number plate, F394, which is in the Point Cook uh, Museum. A10-2 and the other aircraft were uh, assembled in about 18, 1923. Uh, they were used uh, in some sort of vague exercise to train observers. Um, and A10-2 also did some uh, exploratory work in um, survey work in Sydney Harbour. Uh, it made the first crossing of the Bass Strait in a seaplane, took part in the 1924 Hobart Regatta, um, and the publicity for the flight, flight stressed the use of the radio to keep in contact with Point Cook, quite an achievement. It took part in the Barrier Reef survey, as we'll see, and in 1925, Creston was killed uh, and was destroyed. A typical thing that the early aircraft did was take part in ceremonial activities like this uh, um, flight over the British fleet that led, was led by HMS Hood, sunk by the Bismarck later on, that visited Melbourne in 1924. The ferries were often brought out for ceremonial occasions like this. They didn't do a lot of uh, uh, flying otherwise. Just introduce you quickly to another pilot, Pard Mustar. Um, he wasn't. Uh, he, he, his father was a, a labourer. He went to war. Was a signaller at Gallipoli. Joined uh, 
one squadron Royal Flying Corps. He flew with Ross Smith. He became a pilot uh, and very successful and uh, um, fearless. Uh, came to Australia in 1919 and uh, joined the RAAF in 1922. Took part in the survey of Lake Eyre in 1922 and in the Parry Reef as we'll hear shortly. And left the Air Force shortly thereafter and uh, acquired an amazing reputation in New Guinea, which is beyond the scope of this story. Um, he returned and became the Managing Director of Australian Transcontinental Airways served in the RAF in World War II and retired as group captain. Fascinating character. His name was Mustard, but uh, when in the late 20s he got married, his wife said, I don't like this, so he dropped the D off the end of the name. If uh, you haven't read his story, it's well worth exploring. So, of course, the main achievement of the ferries was the Round Australia flight of uh, 1924. A10-3 was chosen for this because it had only done about 20 hours on its engine. Um, I am going to inflict on you, or those people who will listen, the story of the Round Australia flight about this time next year, but it was quite an achievement. So um, start on the 6th of April, finish on the 19th of May, um, a couple of engine changes and all sorts of other events on the way, but that's for next year. Uh, it's very sad what happened to A10-3. It did take part in the Barrier Reef Survey, but um, the Round Australia flight had created a huge amount of interest and so it was decided that this aircraft would be a, uh, a historic one and was withdrawn from service and donated to the Australian War Museum. It was exhibited all over the place with and, and uh, was very, very popular. But in 1929, the AWM trustees decided that the aircraft didn't meet their criteria because it hadn't served during the war. So it was dismantled. And um, last was heard of it was stored in Victoria Barracks, but uh, there's no, la no trace of it now, which is very sad. Some more flights. Uh, another typical one, 18, 18 fly, fly, piloted by McIntyre, located the visiting US fleet in very bad weather off Gabo Island. And uh, the RAF was absolutely delighted because the Americans were uh, amazed that aircraft flew in this weather. It was a huge fleet visit and uh, um, a great follow-up from the Great White Fleet before the war. So there are three aircraft uh, towards the end of the um, service with um, the RAAF. I'm going to give a bit of a, a call out to leading aircraftman and later Sergeant George Goschalk. Uh, I believe he weighed 14 or 15 stone, but uh, nevertheless, he is the, um, the prime choice of uh, the aviators when they wanted to carry with them a, a good mechanic. Um, he uh, took a prominent part in the Round Australia flight and in the Barry Reef surveys, left the RAF in 1925, uh, worked in aviation fields in, and also in New Guinea. A, uh, a fascinating character and a reminder that uh, it's not always the high-ranking officers that are important in a squadron. Apart from the Round Australia flight, the ferries are most known for the Barrier Reef surveys. There were two seasons, 1924 and 1925, of surveying. They produced some great results and also developed many skills. Their base was HMS Geranium. Um, Geranium was sent to Australia, uh, one of three mine sweepers, to uh, clear the German mines that had been dropped in various places in Australia and New, in New, New Zealand during the war. Uh, there weren't too many mi mines to be cleared, but it 
the aircraft, the ships were handed over to Australia and Geranium was commissioned as a survey vessel in 1920. That was very serviceable but uh, made for cold climates and uh, not very good in the tropics but apart from that it worked well. Uh, it was decommissioned in 20, 1927 and scrapped, uh, sunk off Sydney Heads in 1935. 18-3 was the first aircraft to be taken north and it actually travelled on geranium but all the other aircraft were either flown or carried on coastal steamers and as time went on there was more uh, transport by coast, coastal steamers than direct flights. So, as I said, two seasons of surveillance. I don't know where this photo came from but it's certainly very evocative. I thought it might be um, taken from another ship but I've worked out that the davits uh, which were used for raising the air aircraft were swung out to, to have this person on it. Um, they saved, uh, they surveyed quite an amount of country and uh, the aviators work is still celebrated by the naming of mustard patches, Swinbourne patches, he was uh, another prominent pilot of the ferries and Raf Scholes. Townsville was the shore base for much of the 1924 surveying period. You can see that it's not very big. Um, and uh, an assessment made of the aircraft um, points out the fact that they were useful. They increased the safety of the sloop when working within the, rage, when the, within the reef. reef. Raf Scholes I've been able to locate. Here's Kansas, Kansas in the top right hand corner of this uh, um, map and Raf Scholes is um, more or less in the bottom left hand corner about 60 kilometres out of um, Cairns. A few later flights. Um, this one really intrigues me. In uh, 1925 a105 and a106 took part in the Hobart regatta and their um, headline act was simulated torpedo attacks on the visiting Japanese 10,000 ton Isumu class destroyer HIJMS his Imperial Japanese Majesty's ship Iwati uh, at, uh, in view of later events it's uh, fascinating to think that uh, the Australians showed off by attacking the Japanese with their mock torpedo attacks. Um, another interesting thing about this attack was uh, uh, McIntyre flew with A.T. Cole who became Air Vice Marshal Adrian Lindley Trevor Cole, DSO, MC, DFC and A-10-5 was flown by Jonathan Ross of the RNN and his observer was um, later to be known as Sir Peter Drummond, Drummond KCB, DSO and Bar, OBE, MC, RAF Air Marshal during World War II, uh, who took a prominent part in the North African War. Awati um, was a very old ship there even then, it uh, antedated the Battle of Toshima and it was sunk by American bombers in the closing days of World War II. 18.6. Now here's a bit of a riddle. During the period 1925 to 1927, 18.4, 5 and 6 regularly rotated between Point Cook and Eden, New South Wales to provide fleet support for the RAM. RAN. A detachment of up to three aircraft was based at Eden for varying durations during this period. Why? There are no pictures in the newspapers, there are no stories, there's no RAN base in, near Eden, there's no mention of it in the local museum. 
I wonder whether they weren't spotting whales, and uh, that's not fashionable these days, but uh, I'd be interested to know what on earth they were doing because it was a large proportion of the aircraft flying during those few years. Uh, another flight um, from um, Melbourne to Launceston, checking on emergency landing grounds for uh, a proposed passenger and mail service. But the days of the ferries were numbered. They did uh, very useful work, but the main problem was the floats, which were very fragile and needed constant attention. And the walrus with its flying boat hull, I'll do that again, the Seagull 3 with its flying boat hull was far more reliable, more rugged. Uh, they arrived in Australia in about June 1926 and were immediately sent north to take over the Barrier Reef survey. Uh, the ferries were listed on the RWS strengths as trainers, but they seldom flew because they were getting pretty worn out. There weren't a lot of spare parts and other aircraft was available. Uh, they were in such bad condition that uh, the Air Force decided that they couldn't be sold. They were dismantled and uh, the remains of them was burnt. And about the same time, geranium was replaced by HMAS Moresby, which stayed in action till about 1952, as did the successors to the sea Seagull, uh, including the Walrus. Um, Just an interesting side. Just an interesting side light. Um, when Williams returned from his uh, staff college work in England uh, after the uh, round Australia flight by Goebel, uh, he himself did a couple of uh, uh, long distance flights, and the uh, WikiLeak people who seem to be rather biased towards Goebel say that uh, um, he did it uh, because he is jealous of Goebel's success. But regardless of that, flown by McIntyre, which is interesting, uh, he made a flight out of Australia to the Solomon Islands and to New Guinea, and then a flight uh, around Australia, and they used uh, a DH-50A. Uh, there are only two DH-50s uh, imported. This one was supposed to be the Governor General's aircraft, but uh, Williams used it for this flight. And from all uh, reports, it was very reliable in comparison with the uh, ferry which flew around Australia. There were a few ferries in the um, New Zealand Air Force, one of which was a Mark B, Mark 3B, used as a seaplane, only one. Uh, it was used more or less for rescue and flying doctor work at, uh, for a little while. And uh, at the beginning of the war, uh, New Zealand received 47 Fairy Gordons, which are radial engined uh, Fairy 3s, land planes, and uh, uh, they were ostensibly for the defence of New Zealand uh, and written up as uh, still modern aircraft. Heaven help New Zealand if the Japanese had invaded. Uh, they were used for trainers um, for, uh, until uh, 1943 and were all destroyed. But I understand that, uh, uh, at least one is being restored uh, now. The Ferry 3 was the uh, predecessor of a whole series of naval ferry aircraft. Of course, the most famous of that and their medic successor is the Swordfish. Um, was a, a frontline aircraft for all of World War II. The, I believe it uh, made the first attack on a U-boat at the beginning of the war and the last attack on a U-boat at the end of the war, but uh, that might be a little stretching a little bit. The, the ostensible successor to the ferry was the Albacore. You can see it's got a uh, far more sophisticated looking aircraft with a nice enclosed cabin, uh, but it didn't meet uh, with the approval of the crews and uh, actually went out of service before the swordfish did. 
Um, another aircraft from the 1940s was the Barracuda. Um, came into quantity production in about 1943, made some attacks on the Tirpitz. A couple of squadrons came to Australia with the British Pacific Fleet. Uh, didn't like the hot weather, as happened with uh, many other aircraft of the time. The Ferry Fulmar, a naval three-seat fighter and reconnaissance aircraft, uh, did some great work in the defence of Malta. The Ferry Firefly, um, distinguished service in HMS Sydney and uh, I think in Melbourne. Um, a very capable aircraft, could carry a couple of tonnes of bombs actually. Uh, and very rugged, about the only naval aircraft that the British produced that was uh, up to the standards of the Americans uh, in terms of ruggedness anyway. And the final one in the series, of course, the Gannett, anti-submarine uh, warfare aircraft, uh, which went out of service in about 1967. Sadly, there's only one surviving Ferry 3. It's in the Naval Museum at Lisbon in Portugal. The ferries were the first aircraft to cross the South Atlantic from Portugal to the Cape Verde Islands to a rocky outcrop just off the north of uh, South America. And the first aircraft, the Lusitania, uh, flew to this rocky outcrop and while it was being filled it sank which was a bit of a pity so they uh, decided that they'd send out another aircraft which would complete the flight but at the same place uh, it uh, also sank because of the rough weather and uh, other problems so a third aircraft was uh, flown out well it was, ta it was shipped out and um, it actually completed the flight um, to um, Brazil and um, so it is preserved to commemorate the first flight across the South Atlantic and it's wonderful that it is. It's, a, it's an early Model 3 with the Eagle engine and the rectangular tail which was a, a, a feature of um, the early seaplane, uh, the early ferries. So we're coming up to the centenary. What will happen? Well, there's already a few preliminary steps to do something about philately. Um, we'll see what happens there. The first flight had no uh, commemorative stamp and uh, no mail was carried. Uh, the Pals Boys magazine. Um, produced uh, some sticker stamps, Cinderella's, uh, commemorating the flight and uh, was part of the general celebration of the flight. Um, the block that you can see there sold for $1,500 in the year 2009. It'd probably get quite a lot now. And in 1994, there was a series of uh, aviator stamps, including this one with uh, Goebel uh, and McIntyre. So I don't know what is going to happen in 2024, but I do hope the flight is commemorated. Michael Smith, uh, who did the uh, uh, celebration of the Smith flight of 1918-1919, uh, said at one stage that he hoped to uh, fly around Australia, more or less keeping to the timetable of Goebel and Williams and uh, he'd welcome, uh, if that happened, it'd be great to have some other aircraft taking part. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Thanks very much for listening. If you've got more information or you'd like references for facts stated or to chew the matter over in any shape or form, particularly if you've got corrections, because I know that there are a couple of errors in what I've said, no, I'm sorry, I chopped up the last 10 seconds by accident, but, but uh, just a plea for knowledge and uh, and a plea for forgiveness. I noticed that I moved a couple of centuries. I had 2024 there and uh, instead of 1924 and uh, 
I had a couple of other errors, but thanks for staying awake and listening. And uh, I hope uh, it was of minor interest. And I do hope something happens in 2024 because it was a, an amazing feat. Uh, he got the Britannia medal for uh, the Britannia trophy for, uh, or they got the Britannia trophy for um, the most outstanding feat of the year throughout the British Empire. And uh, the uh, hardships that they uh, endured were amazing, mainly because they had to land in the, uh, in the bays and uh, put up with tides going up and down and uh, virtually had to nurse the aircraft 24 hours a day. It's a couple of interesting sidelights about their interaction with the Aboriginal people, which uh, indicate how, uh, how much we've come. So I do hope that uh, it's commemorated but uh, I hope to do the history of it for about this time next year. So thanks very much for listening, people. And over to you. Thank you, Tom. That was really, really interesting. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Tom, just Tom. a question, yeah. or, or maybe a comment, really, I suppose. Yeah. That Ferry 3 in the museum, it didn't seem to have the float under the rear of the tail. Good question, and I, and I hadn't noticed that. Um, uh, I won't try and go back to it with no, no. My, my record of technology. It wouldn't work. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, really, the, the float under the tail is a sort of ugly looking thing, isn't it? You know, it's a, you, 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 the more modern aircraft don't have it. And uh, yes, they have longer floats, exactly. Mm. But uh, they're certainly. Uh, there doesn't seem to be, a, uh, I'll start that again. The seagulls and later the walrus amphibians seem to have had far, far less trouble. Uh, uh, Gable and McIntyre um, on their trip around Australia were all the time repairing the floats and uh, you know, bailing them out so that they could just take off. And uh, you know, when they landed, they were immediately pumping out the floats again. Uh, uh, um, certainly the seaplane, uh, configuration is uh, far stronger. And when you look at the modern seaplanes, they're all, uh, they're, they're, they're all, at least, I'm sorry, the flying boat configuration is stronger. And when you look at the modern uh, flying boats, uh, the sea ray and so on, they're all uh, uh, flying boat configuration, aren't they? Tom, um, in regard to um, Gotch Chalk mechanic, do we know what happened to him after 1927? Yes, uh, I do now. I do remember. No, 1937, uh, I meant. 37. Uh, he didn't take part in the war. Um, and I should know because I chased up his funeral notice. I am pretty sure that he died in 1939. Uh, it's a bit annoying. Yes. Um, Gottschalk did some remarkable things. Uh, at the the glamour sort of goes to the flyers. And uh, even though he got them out of trouble on, on numerous occasions, uh, uh, the sort of uh, engineer type in the Air Force uh, didn't get the recognition. So I tried to chase his story up and uh, it took me a long time on Trove to do it. Whereas if you take people like Williams, you just go to the Australian Dictionary of Biography and it's all there. I'm pretty sure that he died in 1939. Parnell, who wrote uh, the main story of the flight that's readily available, says that the Eagle engine was a wonderful engine. Well, I don't think so because, you know, virtually every time you turn around, the jelly thing conks out and you've got to land and change a valve or do something. Um, and he certainly performed some remarkable uh, repairs en route. Well, um, thanks very much, people. It's uh, I'm um, uh, um, honoured that we had uh, so many people because I was very worried about it. And uh, uh, from the technology point of view, my apologies about that. Guy Pinedo, when he landed in, uh, in Sydney, uh, in Melbourne and Sydney, uh, created a lot of stir with his aircraft, even though it had only the same size engine as the Eagle. But uh, the newspaper Truth, which, as you know, was anything but the truth, <laughs> really, really lambusted the uh, RAAF for flying such uh, terrible aircraft when Deep Pinedo had uh, this uh, 
quite streamlined uh, flying boat. Uh, and the article is uh, is uh, yeah, typical of truth. It's quite uh, I had it in. And uh, can I tell you one more one more story? In fact, I'll ask a question. Does anyone know? This will test the New South Wales people to see if they've been reading their southern skies. Does anyone, so New, Castle, New South Wales people, be quiet for a moment. Does anyone know the first time an air, aircraft flew from a ship to attack a shore target? No? Okay, New South Wales people, did you read your southern skies? It was the Japanese. At the end of 1914, the Japanese attacked Tsing Tao in China, and they had a seaplane carry with farmers which conducted bombing raids on Tsing Tao. So despite the fact that the Royal Naval Air Service regards it as the pioneers, the Japs beat them to it, which I think is another gentle irony. <laughs> Tom, George um, Lancelot got yes. died at Catherine on the 12th of August, 1939. Yep. He was driving from Darwin to That's Melbourne right. at the time via Adelaide. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in another road accident, he just died, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, he uh, was involved in a lot of, uh, um, sorry, I'll rephrase that. He's involved in some uh, route planning for the airlines in, in the 30s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. I was right with the 1939 death. <laughs> right. The easiest way, if you do want to um, do something at this stage, is probably to send me an email, and I'll send it on. The official, um, the official um, time for consultation has, in theory, closed, but uh, uh, you can get uh, you, you can get through uh, to the official consultation. The big problem is. They had the consultation and everyone says, oh, please uh, don't uh, pull out the steam gallery, don't pull out the uh, aircraft engines, don't destroy the RAND building. And then they uh, simply produced a, a plan and said, we've consulted and we're going to do it anyway. So can I ask a question of everybody? Then this is just for the record. Is there anyone here who thinks it's a good idea to take the technology out of the powerhouse and take the airplanes out of the powerhouse? Speak now, oh. hold your face. Okay, Definitely so I, I, uh, I reserve the right to say I was at a meeting which had uh, people from New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, and people were unanimous in thinking it was a stupid idea. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks for your support. We've, we've got to win this one. I mean, it's bloody criminal. But anyway, as I said, I really appreciate uh, all the people that came. It's uh, really wonderful. And uh, uh, I hope I hope I can, Lebius Horton is a fascinating character. Character. I hope that uh, if, you see, if we're still short of speakers, I can do something about his career as an aircraft owner. Uh, didn't last very long. He metaphorically crashed and burnt, not in an aeroplane, but in about 1925, he really had a, a bad time. And uh, then this time next year, the uh, Global Round Australia uh, flight. If you Google at the film archive, Global Round Australia flight, there's a very interesting short video uh, which shows the ferry in flight. And uh, 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 an interesting graphic of how he flew around Australia. So, Thanks very much, people. That's really, really great. Just before we go, uh, yeah. a little while ago, Tsing Tao was mentioned. For those yeah. who don't know, Tsing Tao was a German equivalent of Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, it was a German colony on the edge of China, a uh, fair bit north, and they had a German Pacific fleet there, of which the Emden was one of the ships. Uh, in World War I, broke out. They more or less scattered. Most of them went southeast across the Pacific. End up with the Battle of the Falklands and other places down around South America. Um, but uh, Sing Tao beer still exists. They had a German brewery there. Yeah. They still do. I'm sure it's good. Yeah. And the, the Germans had, I think, only one aircraft. 
which uh, 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 to defend the place, but they did have an air defense. So it was the first, the first battle of uh, the first time that that type of uh, action was took place, and the Japanese got very good at it, as we saw in uh, in uh, December nineteen forty one, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. It's uh, it's been uh, a great evening, and uh, I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you have too. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. 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 Thank you, Tom.